How you doing? Can you hear me all right? Um, so thanks for coming. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. I wasn't nervous about doing this until my fiance told me that her aunts were going to watch the video of it afterwards. So <laughs> there's like eight of them, and that made me nervous. But I'm not really nervous. I'm just kidding. So uh, that's me. All right, that's my slide. So my name's Chris Bishop. I'm the creative director of PBS Kids. And uh, I'm going to talk to you today about how kids taught me how to design for kids. So uh, a little bit of background. I started working at PBS Kids in 2000, so I've been there almost 14 years. And what I do is design websites and apps for kids. And uh, I need my notes. This is the hardest part. And uh, the main thing I do is make interfaces. Uh, the interface is to get kids to their favorite show or their favorite game or whatever. So ideally, they spend as little time as possible with what I made, you know, even just seconds, that's fine, and get to what they want to do. And uh, I feel very lucky that I have this job. I studied uh, fine art and illustration in college, and uh, PBS, so I didn't really have any marketable skills when I graduated, aside from like charcoal <laughs> drawing, I guess, which there's not a big demand for, but uh, I. Uh, applied for a job as illustrator at PBS Kids, and when I got there for the interview, they were like, this is really a web design job, and I was like, cool, that's the job I want, you know, anyway, so I was psyched about that. And I think it was pretty smart on their part, because uh, as you'll see in some of the stuff I show you, being an illustrator, well, when you're designing for kids, being, being an illustrator is a huge asset, you know, because there's the stuff we make, the lines are blurred between illustration and design, so. Um, I also think I'm re really lucky that I get to be hands-on in my job still. Like, I have to manage, but I'm also still making stuff. And that's really important to me, and that keeps me happy. So the first thing I wanted to show you guys was uh, some of my favorite projects. This is the PBS Kids homepage. If you have kids, you may have seen it before. Um, this just relaunched over the summer, and we're really proud of it. And one of the cool things about it is after 10 plus years of being a Flash site, we've completely moved off of Flash. It's all HTML now. It's really sweet. You should check it out. Um, this is our PBS Kids video app for iPad. Um, I love this one. This was the first app I ever got to design. And uh, it's really cool, because as soon as you launch the app, it just starts playing a nice big video, like Oscar here. And you know, some buttons on the side if you want to switch to a different show. Uh, this is our PBS Kids brand redesign, which we did last year. After many years of the same look, we decided to do something fresh. And I had the honor of being able to come up with these characters and these colors and this world and the whole story behind it all. And uh, like I said, it launched last year. It's on TV and print and web everywhere. So like, very proud of this. Um, this is what I'm working on now. It's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a cheeseburger car, but... Uh, <laughs> And, that, and that's me in it. But uh, this is what I'm working on now. It's a virtual world for kids. So it's like a, pl a game where you know, everyone's in there together and you can see all the other kids going around. And uh, I can't show you much of it because it's still being worked on now. But I did want to show you a little sneak preview of the cheeseburger car. And uh, this one's really fun for me because I get to, as well as, I get to be the lead illustrator on it and draw all the characters and the world and all that stuff as well as being creative director on it. So that's really fun for me, and also probably a conflict of interest. <laughs> um, <laughs> so testing with kids is probably the most important thing we do at PBS Kids. It really influences uh, everything that we make. And uh, there's so much can be learned just from observing how a kid plays a game, or how they use an app, or just how they use technology. And uh, all right, so. <laughs> Testing with kids, like I said, it's the most important thing we do. It influences everything we make. And I don't have kids myself, but I've shown a lot of things I made to my niece, Anna, and she loves everything I've ever made, and that's not helpful in any way to me. So <laughs> this is why we take, we go to testing with kids we don't know, because if you, if you know any kids, they can be very honest and very harsh if they don't like what you've made. Even if you're sitting right there, they'll tell you. And uh, I, sometimes I think I notice like adults. If you give them an interface, they don't understand. They 
blame themselves or they think they're dumb because they can't figure it out, but kids will always blame you and what you made, and that's the way it should be. <laughs> the ways, there's two ways we test usually. We do formal testing where we're behind like a law and order mirror that they can't see through, and there's a moderator in there with one kid or sometimes two kids or sometimes a group of kids. <clears throat> and the other way we do it is uh, informally, we'll get permission to go into a classroom and we'll bring a big stack of iPads and just watch them play, you know, whatever game we're testing and take from that what we can. And usually when we do formal testing, we try to build out a prototype that it's, that's as close to what we plan to launch with as possible because, as you can imagine with kids, sometimes it's hard for their imagination to leap if I'm showing them a piece of paper that's going to be an app someday. So, you know, we try to do as much as we can. So anyways, like I said, I started in 2000. It's, I've been there a long time, and back in the early days of designing for kids, I made a lot of mistakes, and I learned some stuff really fast. Things like, this icon doesn't work for kids. We all know what this means, but you know, kids 10 years ago didn't know what that thing was, and they certainly don't today. So that was a bad one. Uh, this games icon, like we all know what that thing is, and we know what it represents, but they haven't been used in 30 years, you know, so, you know, that one's not very good either. Um, wow, this one, yeah. So, early on we were tasked with coming up... <laughs> early, early on we were tasked with coming up with a way where kids could find their local PBS station and then get their TV schedule, right? So, right away there's huge red flags for us because it requires a kid to know their freaking zip code and type that in or pick find their city, you know, pick their city, then pick their state to identify their, uh, their local station. So, as you can imagine, this bombed. It was like very awkward day, two days of testing. And in the end, we realized kids don't even need to look up a TV schedule because their lives are already so scheduled that they know, you know, this show airs when I wake up, this one's on when I get home from school. So it wasn't even needed. It ended up becoming a thing more for parents. Uh, this one is really important to me. Uh, Early on, we were testing a new design for the PBS Kids website homepage, and uh, I included this drawing. This is our character, Dot. I included a little picture of her on there with this snail because I thought it was cute and would you know, make the page nice. And in testing with the kids, we asked them, what's the first thing you would click on on this you know, homepage? There's a lot of stuff on there. And one little girl said, that snail. And this thing was tiny on the screen. And so we asked her, like, what would you expect to get when you click on the snail? And she said, information about snails. And that's, <laughs> and that's brilliant, because that totally made sense to her. Now, to me as an adult, it was just a spot illustration, but to her it was content and navigation. And that was, that was really eye-opening for me, because after that I realized, you need to think like that little girl about every single thing you put on the screen and how someone might interpret it. So that brings us to today. Um, I've learned a lot over the years and I'm much wiser now and I'm here to share with you some of my philosophies about designing interactive you know, things for kids. Uh, the biggest thing I think is that simple is good. Now, that's just good advice for designing for anybody but it's especially important for my audience because half of them haven't even learned to read yet. So this is our homepage again. You see there's really only two words on there, games and video, and you really only have four options. You can go watch a video, go play a game, the big wheel in the center has all our shows, you can pick your show, or you can do the thing at the top, which is like, you know, something featured that changes every day. And uh, another part of keeping it simple is we try to, we use the phrase, make it a toy. It to us, that means that like, I really, I don't ever want to design a web, or I don't ever want to design a website for a kid that looks like a website. I want it to look like something they haven't really ever seen before. And uh, we, I try to make the navigation like this wheel here. I want it, when you look at it, it looks fun, and I want interacting with it to feel fun, like a toy. And then this wheel, it just looks like a Fisher Price toy from the 80s, you know, it's like, you know, <laughs> that's fun. All right, the next thing is the word games. The word games is, hugely important to us, and it's kind of magical because everyone can read the word games. I've seen kids that don't know how to read, they can read the word games. And uh, when kids go to play apps or go online, the number one thing they want to do is play games. So it's hugely important to us to have a big games button on the homepage. Now, if you, if you don't have that button, 
even if you're a site full of games, if you don't have a button that says games, some kids will say, there's no games here, and that that's bad for us. And you might say, just put all the games on the home page, but for some kids, they need to see a button that says games and press it and then go somewhere and then feel satisfied that they got games. Uh, man, nobody reads instructions. Kids sure don't. I don't read instructions. You probably don't. Um, you'd be surprised. People are so wordy with, with things they make for kids. Um, it's, it's, it's really important, obviously, for us to teach kids how to play the games. If they start playing a game and don't know how to do it, they're going to quit and probably not come back. So I think the best way to make instructions is do it visual. So uh, show them what they have to do. Don't tell them. And even better, on top of that, um, have audio that tells you what you need to do. And then the, my favorite thing also is only teach someone what they need to know when they need to know it. So in this example I have here, car comes up to a hill, that's a good time to teach them how to jump. Uh, another one of my big philosophies is to question everything. So I feel like when designing websites, there's a lot of things that just feel obvious to us because we've used them so many times, like... Uh, like creating a username. Uh, but for a kid, you, you really have to think, this might be the first time they're doing this. They may not know how to do it. So we, we went into testing with a process where kids were creating an account, username, password, all that stuff. And we really broke down every step to analyze you know, how they interacted with it. And w this was in a classroom. And I sat down with a kid, and I was like, you know, what, what do you want your username to be? And he just uh, <clears throat> he put in his name. And very slowly typed in his name, and you know, and it said, "Sorry, that name's taken." And he just looked at me like, "Now what?" You know, like that was just a dead end for him because he's never made a username before, and that's his name. Um, then another kid, I sat down and said, "What do you want your username to be?" And he said, five dollar signs." All right, uh, that's the most awesome username I've ever seen. And I told him that, and he said, "Let's do twelve dollar signs." <laughs> And, but if you know anything about computers, you know you can't have dollar signs in your username. So that, that didn't work. But then later in the process, it was required that a parent's email address was required to enter when a kid created an account. And as you can imagine, that killed it. You know, it was just a blocker for so many people because uh, kids don't know their parents' email address. And if they go ask, you know, what's your email address? I want to put it in the computer. The parents not going to give it to them. So, you know, stuff like that was stripped out. Um, Sometimes there's parts of sites that seem, they seem required just, I guess, because everyone else does it or that's just how it is. So when we made our first online video player, we had, a sh had to put a share function on it. I think just because if you make anything for the internet, you have to have share buttons on it. That was our reason. And uh, it turned out in testing, kids didn't really have any, they didn't really want to send the video they watched to their friends. And uh, even if they wanted to, they probably didn't know their friend's email address. And probably no one involved even had an email address. So that clearly didn't work. And uh, we ended up moving, moving the ability to share a video up to the p parents area of the interface. And at that point, it was just taking up valuable real estate you know, in my design. And we, we watched the traffic, and no one was using it. And I'll never forget, we went in with parents and asked them about you know, sharing videos. And the, the best answer was one dad was just like, who would I send this to? <laughs> and he's right, man, it's penguin skiing. You know, you can't see, who's he gonna send that to? So we, did that, we ended up removing that feature. You know, early on it seemed necessary. In the end, we just nixed it, because we didn't need it. Um, this is funny too, the pause button. On that same video player, we had a pause button, and it just seemed like kids would never pause the video. It's just not a thing they ever wanted to do. And then it, kids, and then we were like, wait, kids don't ever want to stop the video. When they're done, they just run away, you know? So <laughs> for a minute, I was like, let's get rid of the pause button. But we ended up keeping it. It wasn't hurting anybody, so we just left it on there. One sec. So anyways, question everything. That's, that was that segment. Um, trick the user. So... I love tricking the user. What it, what it really means is I can, use to my, I can use their assumptions to my advantage when designing these interfaces. So for example, this is our part of our website called Hard Games. You could say it says Hard Games up there. So when kids get to be like six, seven, or eight, 
they don't want to play a lot of the games on our site because they're for their baby games. And in my business, being babyish is a kiss of death. So even if there's some really cool games, you know, one Barney game in there can be a deal breaker for the whole thing. So we create a, an area called hard games. So those guys, when they see it, they'll know like, okay, this is for me. All the other stuff, that's not mine. This is my stuff because I'm an advanced gamer. <laughs> <laughs> They are, they're good. But uh, the truth is, these games aren't harder than any of the other games on the site. You know, we just, uh, they are targeted at older kids, so probably would be more appropriate. But in the end, they're really just hard games just because we called them that. Another big design challenge that I have is uh, we have a lot of shows, and uh, we need to present. I need to present these shows in a way that you can easily comprehend what you're looking at and easily find the one you want. You know, there's like, I don't know, a lot here, 22 or something. So we tried a lot of things over the years, and the solution we came up that I think is pretty sneaky is this wheel, which I showed you earlier. Um, as you can see, you know, you see half the wheel, there's eight shows on there, right? So if you come here and you find your favorite show there, you just click it, you're good. If you don't see your favorite show, then where is it? It's, uh, it's on the other side of that wheel. So, you know, the way your brain understands it is, I just gotta spin this around where the other shows are, right? But we're sneaky, we built it so that we can have any number of shows on the other side. There's actually 14 over there currently, you know, they come and go, and they kind of pop on as the thing rotates. So, to the user, they don't know, they just feel, it just feels very natural, you know, that it's like, what I want's on the other side, so they don't really feel overwhelmed by too many choices. Um, another thing we do, we realized at some point that we could hide things in plain sight. Uh, for example, this is our online video player, and we had the need to show information for parents alongside content for kids, right? So that sounds like it could be a nightmare, but we realized we could just put it right up there at the top in this bar, right, and kids don't even notice it. And there's stuff up there, and that thing even rotates and does stuff. It's content for parents. It tells them how long the video is, something they always want to know, and what educational goals it's teaching, that kind of stuff. What's the name of the clip? And we could put it up there right in plain sight. It would never distract kids or bother them. Why? Because there's a, there's a giant Arthur video playing underneath it. But, you know, <laughs> you know we know that they're not going to stray up there because they're into something else. Um, I've got a couple more philosophies. Don't get comfy. This is really important. The uh, kids, over the years, kids keep getting more and more tech savvy. Like I said, I've been doing it a long time. And, you know, things are, in the, you know, in this industry, things are 100% different from what they were when I started in 2000. And kids are getting, we, we need to stay on, we need to stay on top of what devices they use, how they use them what they're able to do, what they're not able to do, what stuff they want to do, what stuff they don't want to do anymore. It changes every year. It's really important to stay on top of it. And uh, something we noticed lately that is going to sound obvious, but there's like a whole generation of kids now that have only used touch screens. They've never used mouse or keyboard. So if you give them a game with a mouse and keyboard and put it in front of them, they look like, at you like you're crazy because you are. It's like such a different thing. And then they try to touch the monitor. And I do it too sometimes. You, you probably have as well. Um, my last philosophy is be sophisticated. So you don't need to dumb down your design for kids because kids really deserve good design. You don't have to do this. You don't have to write it in chalk and make the SZ and put clowns with it or any of that stuff. <laughs> and make the Z backwards. <laughs> um, this is a little, this is another look at our new branding. like. I think it's pretty sophisticated. We try to do some cool stuff with the line work back there and vibrant colors and all that nice stuff. Kids seem, seem to like it so far. But uh, <clears throat> anyways, yeah, uh, that's all I got. Kids deserve good design, and thanks for listening.